conference. Now, when I talk about interdisciplinary work, the speaker who I'm uh, about to introduce really epitomizes the best of what we hope to accomplish. Parta Sabeti was an MIT undergrad who then did a Rhodes Scholarship at Oxford where she got her PhD and came to Harvard Medical School where I was impressed to see that she graduated summa cum laude. Summa cum laude is an honor that is conferred very rarely at the medical school. And uh, it really it shows remarkable accomplishment. The, um, the one predecessor of hers that I know about was Judah Falkman, who, who was basically the person who, who unlocked the entire field of angiogenesis and inhibition of angiogenesis, which ultimately led to some of the most important innovations in cancer therapy. Uh, I'm not saying that Pardis will be a failure if she doesn't achieve those heights, but uh, she's well on her path to, to do something that's a lot like that. I, I think that she would describe herself as a computational geneticist. Is that a fair statement? And um, through her work at the Broad Institute and, uh, and at Harvard, she's made a huge uh, reputation at a very early age. And I have to reveal something that's maybe semi-confidential. I actually knew about Pardis from when she was um, on, first on the job market uh, to become an assistant professor. And at the time, I was the chair of a committee at Stanford that makes all final decisions about faculty appointments and promotions. And every now and then, you read a file that makes you say, oh, <laughs> pretty impressive. Uh, and Partisis was one of those. And many of you will think the obvious thing, for those of you who know, that it was because she was in a rock band, and I guess she still is. Uh, but it's actually the remarkable combination of skills and the kinds of problems that she'd applied those skills to. Uh, and I think at the time she had done some really amazing work on positive selection and its role in resistance to malaria. And uh, really, a demonstration of how application of relatively new tools for a problem that had usually been approached from a very different direction could yield some fantastic new insights. And uh, we, ex and what's also very interesting is though. Pardis does a lot on genetics and genomics. She's applying it to some very practical clinical problems uh, like loss of fever, which I think a lot of her recent work is focused on and is one of the most difficult clinical challenges because there are really no effective treatments for the disease, which is fairly common in Africa. So I'm delighted that she'll be speaking to us now about some of her recent work, uh, and, and I hope that Part of what will happen today is that as you hear of the work of various people and the discussion that follows, you will be stimulated to think about some of the problems that, that you address in your own research in new ways and to think about new collaborations, new tools that will be helpful. So thank you and welcome Pardis. Thank you very much for having me here today, and uh, thank you so much to Provost Garver for a very humbling, gracious uh, introduction. So um, uh, I have a lot to, lot to work on. <laughs> um, uh, today I'll be speaking about evolutionary forces in humans and pathogens, and the most of the research I'll tell you about is the work that we've done studying human evolution that have given us clues into our past and our, and our response to infectious diseases around us. Um, and so the two parts of the talk will be of mainly speaking about the adaptive traits in humans and uh, a little bit about the work we're doing on microbial evolution. So starting with the adaptive. Uh, so many individuals in this room will know better than I will how much evolution has likely shaped us and shaped the human genome. And in 1858, when Darwin and Wallace published their papers on natural selection, it was the first time that really gave a voice to the process by which the organisms on this planet, including potentially humans, had been evolving. And then a few years later, when Darwin published The Descent of Man, it really brought humans into that forefront. But actually, um, it took a, uh, uh, quite a long time afterwards um, until we had the first example of human evolution, uh, a first elucidated example. And that would have been the sickle cell trait that protects from malaria. Um, really sort of first set out by Haldane in the 1940s and then characterized by A.C. Allison 
um, in the 1950s, it gave us that first example of the development of an adapt adaptive trait that protects from malaria. Um, and since that time, there have been a few other examples that have been characterized, like lactose tolerance, the ability to drink milk after we domesticated cattle, or uh, changes in pigmentation that occurred as we moved into different parts um, uh, of the planet with lower sunlight. And so with those few examples that have been characterized, there, it started, um, those mainly started with a biological hypothesis, something that we believed to be important in human evolution. But when we looked at it on a genomic level, we found a signature that told us that selection was likely acting. Um, and when we started to sequence uh, the human genome in the genomic era, we were able to begin to characterize these signals much more closely. We had large databases of genetic variants in humans, large data sets of genotypes, so uh, sort of population diversity, and now we have full sequence genome data for many individuals coming out. And in this new era, we can really search the whole genome looking for no more stories like that, so natural selection across the genome. The data sets that we look like look a lot like this. I really, the work I do is, as a computational geneticist, is mining um, sequences uh, throughout the genome, the thousands, millions, billions of nucleotides that make up the genomes of different organisms on Earth. And what we're looking for is a footprint, a footprint that gets left behind when natural selection is occurring. And we try to um, identify those footprints and then within them try to pinpoint what was the variant that caused that pattern to occur. And the very nice thing is that we can actually do that by looking at a set of individuals living today. So with just about 100 individuals, even less than that, we can actually um, take their DNA um, and mine it for these patterns. And so a lot of times in, in different groups, not this one, but when I'm trying to explain it, I actually have to let them know that there is that archaeological record uh, here in our DNA that we can trace this from. And what we're looking for is a pattern of when a new mutation emerges. So this is just a cartoon of uh, sort of before natural selection would occur, and in that second generation, a new mutation emerges that is somehow, you know, beneficial to either the survival or the reproductive success of individuals who carry it. And that just means that that individual is more likely to survive, reproduce, and pass on that mutation to their children, and their children are more likely to survive, reproduce, and pass it on to their children's children. And in a shorter period of time, obviously this is just a cartoon, but in a short period of time, um, it can rise to very high prevalence. So what we're looking for are things that have risen to high prevalence in a relatively short amount of time. And the kinds of patterns that that leaves behind in the genome look like this, another cartoon now showing you across a chromosome. Let me get my... So uh, here's a chromosome here, and I'm just showing you five cartoon positions across the region before selection. And so there are two things that are driving the kind of diversity that we see. There's mutation, two common things. Mutation, generating new variants, so turning these greens to purples. And then there's recombination that reshuffles the background on e which each of these exist. So you can see here that the, the different greens and purples exist on different backgrounds from the different loci. So it looks like a mosaic. So as these new mutations are emerging, you're generating new variants, and those variants are mixing with other variants on that chromosome where you get this sort of mosaic pattern. Um, but when a new variant emerges and spreads relatively quickly through the population, it may happen so quickly that there hasn't been time for that reshuffling to occur. And so what we look for when we look for selection is an event where a single variant will rise to high prevalence but take with it the variants nearby on that chromosome. We call that a selective sweep, and we call these other variants nearby hitchhikers. So they have hitchhiked along to high prevalence in the population. And there are three types of methods that are commonly used in population data and genetic diversity in a population to detect that. The first is we look for something called long-range correlations, also called long haplotypes. It's essentially a region in which you have all of the variants highly correlated with each other. If you have a variant at one position, it'll be matched very closely to another variant. And, and that's sort of a tracker of how long something's been around. So if it has uh, many correlations of very conserved haplotype, it's quite young. So if you see something on a long haplotype that's very prevalent, suggest it got there very quickly. We also look for population differentiation. A lot of the variants that we're looking for in the last you know, 5, 10, 
30,000 years are things that will have happened after the split of populations. So when you see places in the genome that are very different between population groups, that's another signal that something is going on. Um, and then finally, another one that has sort of a lot of jargon in it, but it's called high-frequency derived allele. That it, derived allele is the new variant. So originally, before mutation occurs, everyone looks the same, and that's the ancestral variant. And when the new mutation occurs, it creates a derived variant. So um, those derived variants initially are going to be at very low prevalence in the population. And another word for prevalence is frequency. So that what this is essentially saying is a high prevalence of the new alleles. They've emerged to high prevalence. So those are the kinds of signals that individuals look for. And using that, they found many different regions under selection. But we haven't gotten much further than that in identifying elucidated characters. Um, and this is because... Um, and this is because this process is very, uh, very long. Um, so here's essentially, you know, what we've characterized since that time. We've had uh, the sickle cell mutation that protects from mal malaria, as I said, the pigmentation, the lactose tolerance, and then in early stages in this work, some evidence that there were hair and sweat mutations under selection in Asia. But still, all of these hundreds of candidates that we've identified, we haven't gotten much further. And that reason is the path to adaptive evolution is a very long and drawn out process with many stages. The first thing you have to do is detect the signal. And what we were doing, essentially using these different tests I'm describing to find regions in the genome where you see evidence of this footprint. But then from there, you want to figure out, you know, where is it localizing to? Where exactly in the genome is it happening? Because those original re regions could be a megabase, a million nucleotides long with one mutation somewhere hidden in there. So you want to localize where it's coming from and then pinpoint the variant that might be important and then understand what it's doing. Um, and so these are the kinds of things that we're trying to get at. And so in my group, uh, Sherry Grossman and Ilya Schlechter developed what we call the composite multiple signals. The different groups that were working in these areas used the long haplotype, the derived allele, the differentiated signals separately. There's a lot of different groups focusing on different tests. But what we realized in looking at the tests very closely is that they actually each have a lot to offer that's quite distinct. And that while each test will pick up the general signal that's occurring there, um, when you actually combine and look for mutations that carry all of those signals, the, the causative variant, the driver, should have all those signals because it's driving the existence of those signals. And maybe others nearby will as well, but most of the other region, uh, variants in the region will not have all of the signals. They will just have randomly picked up one or the other. Um, and so here is basically uh, five different tests that are based on the three signals I described. And this is essentially what the data would always look like before, where you would see... Um, kind of a, a, you know, sort of a pattern that somewhere over here, things are spiking to a significant level by any one of the single tests. But as you can see, there are many variants within the region. It's sort of a cloud, and it's very difficult to see who is the driver within that region. And there might be a million uh, nucleotides within that region that are all kind of spiking over the significance level. But as we applied all of the tests simultaneously, um, we found a much cleaner signal. And this essentially, I'd been working in this field for about a decade, and, and many people who had been working with me had said, you know, at the end of the day, we're just going to have just so stories because we can get these regions, but the fact that selection occurred and created these large sweeps makes it impossible to ever figure out what's going on within them. Um, so this was a huge breakthrough, um, where in this region was a megabase long region where we knew there was a pigmentation gene within it. We wanted to see whether or not we could localize to that pigmentation gene because we'd believed that that was the likely causal variant. And indeed, actually, the signal falls right on top of MAP-P, which is a classic uh, pigmentation uh, gene uh, that is known to have variants in it in Europeans that are important. Um, and here, there's a phenylalanine to leucine change that is important within them. Um, and so what we did is actually we had some very early results with the, the small number of classic examples that we had. We tested a number of other pigmentation genes, and in every case, it fell right on top of the pigmentation gene and looked very compelling. Um, and we also tested some of the other known variants. And so with that um, sort of confidence build and also having done a lot of simulation work, we applied it to the Thousand Genomes Project. And this is a project, um, a collaboration sort of driven by the NIH, but from uh, collaborators from around the world working together to catalog genetic variation in at least now 25 different uh, populations around the world and do deep sequencing of about 100 individuals in each population. 
Um, and so within that project, we applied the same statistic to many tests, to many different uh, regions of the genome. We've only done three of the populations so far, and many of the other ones are forthcoming. But you can see this is the, those original signals that we found, the ones that we originally used to detect regions were under selection, that footprint. And you can see that there's a footprint, things are spiking, but you wouldn't really be able to figure out what's the driver in that region. But when we applied our CMS test, it cleaned up the signal very nicely. And so there's still a number of mutations in that region that are so tightly linked to the causal variant, you, you know, you, you can't really distinguish them. But we're now much better at pinpointing what's the locus that's important um, and sort of where the signal's coming from, and then having a much smaller set of candidates in which we're mining. And so the process that we now describe with, that Sherry and Ilya uh, began and, and working with uh, Christian Anderson and Shervin Tabrizi in my group, we moved on to was essentially um, uh, starting with the genome scan that we were doing, finding a number of genetic variants that were important or regions that were important, then trying to find map those variants to specific loci in the genome. And then after that, the next part of that process moves into functional characterization. We have to see, is there anything in that region that could be biologically meaningful? And so the next thing we did is start working with computational annotations. Other groups around the world have done a great job of characterizing proteins and different kinds of transcription factors that drive expression of those proteins or other regulatory elements. So we're using a lot of these annotations to figure out if any of the variants within our region are meaningful. And then we moved to functional experiments. And in this case, this is a paper that we um, were, were working on, essentially. We, we found a set of variants, and one of them was in a gene called toll-like receptor 5 that is an innate immune gene that's important in how we respond to flagellated bacteria. And in the experiment that we did, we essentially took uh, two versions. We created two versions of the protein, one with the mutation. There's an amino acid change that we found under selection within that protein, uh, one with the change, one without, and then um, made them respond to flagellin, which is in which is a sort of protein in flagellated bacteria, and saw whether or not the signaling cascade changed. And we found a, a significant difference in the signaling cascade in a number of different cell types. So it sort of led us to believe that potentially flagellated bacteria were driving some sort of evolution of this gene, um, changing the response to um, different kinds of flagellated bacteria, like salmonella typhi that causes typhoid fever. Um, another variant that we characterized was a variant that was under selection in Asians. Um, originally, when we did our scan, um, the sort of first scan that started telling us this region might be important is this 800 kilobase region. So again, it's 800,000 nucleotides long with many different genes within the region. And so using this kind of approach, we actually were able to, to really uh, hone down on just a few things that were high scoring once you combined all of the tests. And within that, there was an amino acid change, a valine to alanine change in a gene called EDAR. And the interesting thing about EDAR when we were looking at it was it had already kind of popped up on a radar for people looking at selection. Um, David Kingsley and his group at Stanford had done an analysis where they looked at um, fish, stickleback fish, moving from seawater to freshwater. And in essence, they, they noticed that the stickleback fish, as they moved into freshwater, continually were losing their scale. It was sort of a pattern that they were losing their scale. They didn't need it as much in the freshwater. Perhaps it caused a lot of uh, you know, energetic cost to, to create them. And so they identified that this signaling pathway, this ETA pathway, ectodysplasin, was driving those changes. And so here we have the ectodysplasin receptor under selection in Asian populations, and we wanted to explore that. Um, and so we uh, set out to do a number of things, um, uh, which is in one case, we, we basically wanted to explore this variant in many different ways. There was a group just before we had started who had um, done an analysis, an association study in human populations that showed that the variant in, um, that we were interested in, this valine to alanine change, was associated with a change in the width of the hair, so the thickness of the hair on the head. Um, was, was thicker um, in Asian individuals carrying this mutation. So, sort of had, so we had already had some biological evidence this might be important. Um, and so I actually collaborated with Cliff Taven, who's here, as well as Bruce Morgan and Dan Lieberman, to set out to do this together. And this is actually gives you an example of the kind of work that can only happen at Harvard that is this very multidisciplinary integrative group. And what we did together is we set out to 
um, explore, explore these variants from several different angles. And so um, Yana Kambaroff and Sija Wong, two postdocs working with us, did this work, where in essence, um, Yana working in Cliff's lab was able to place the single mutation that we had been interested in into a mouse, um, and, and the mouse had several very interesting changes. Um, as we expected from the human phenotype, they had m thicker hair on their heads, uh, so as measured by the number of cells across, sorry, thicker hair on their bodies. Um, so in, in multiple different um, hair types, we saw that sort of thickness had increased as we would have expected from the human. We saw differences in the mammary glands, so smaller uh, mammary gland size, different ductal patterns. And then we also found one thing that we're very interested in, which is an increase in um, eccrine glands. So an increase in the number of sweat glands that we could measure on the palms of the, uh, of the mouse. And Sija Wang, working with a collaborator, Li Jin, in China, um, was able to actually recapitulate that phenotype in humans. The humans carrying that mutation also had increased sweat glands. And in another analysis, we also were able to date the mutation, and it appears to have emerged about 30,000 years ago in central China, and then populated parts of Asia, and moved also into Native American populations. So this work, uh, we, uh, we published all together um, uh, in cell, uh, the two papers on the toll-like receptor, and it kind of gave you that example of the, the footprints that are left behind um, that we can detect in the human genome and recapitulate in these model organisms. But the, that was just you know, a couple examples, a toll-like receptor 5 I told you about, an EDAR as well. But we can actually, we've begun to find many variants that look like this. Each one might tell a story. Um, and so here we have uh, different mutations that we're looking at, where we begin with the signal, start actually modeling the proteins to see which ones might be biologically meaningful, look at the conservation of the proteins to also try to understand if that region might be functionally important. Um, and there are other things, so those are just examples. Again, each one of these takes a very long time to get to that elucidated trait, but we have lots of candidates now we're very excited about. Um, we have 56 overlaps with EQTLs, those are expression quantitative traits. Um, so where the signal of selection that we have overlaps a signal of changes in expression to that gene that we're exploring. We have 160 overlaps with known genome-wide association studies. People have already been looking at phenotypes of different mutations. 165 of our, our signals actually overlap a, a, a known association with a phenotype. And the ones that we're commonly finding are pigmentation, height, autoimmune disease, infectious disease, things that we might be uh, might suspect might be prone to evolution. Um, and here, basically, we were just showing data from a TB study and a leprosy study where the mutation that's under selection is also associated with resistance. Um, and then the last kind of category we've look, been looking at closely um, are enhancers, other kinds of regulatory elements. The interesting thing is that we're finding when we're doing association studies in these scans is that protein coding changes are a very small part of the picture, but these regulatory elements driving how genes are expressed and changed and what different cell types things function in are very much important in different phenotypes we're seeing as well as in natural selection. So what we've moved from is this story where we have hundreds of candidates, but we can't really see what's going on within that, that now we're beginning to pinpoint specific genes, find these sort of changes that might be important in function, like expression changes, genes that are important in these things called long non-coding RNAs, which are all, all together new kinds of elements that are non-coding, um, and then different kinds of changes like this, splice site mutations. So we're having more and more candidates than we can look at, and we're beginning to also see different, as we look at the different elements that are under selection, a picture of things that are important, like metabolism, infectious disease, sensory perception, um, pigmentation, sweat, and hair. And so we're, we are, in our group, pursuing a number of these kinds of things, like the hair and sweat work, the cholera, uh, the flagellated bacteria, and in another study that I won't have time to describe here, but a, another example of how this can be used in a powerful way, we've been studying cholera. Eleanor Carlson in my group, who's also incidentally the little girl with the very light skin in that picture, um, is a postdoc in my lab working with Regina LaRoque at MGH. And together we actually explored a population from Bangladesh, the Bengali, who've been exposed to cholera for, for many, many centuries 
first evidence in 5th century BC. And so Bangladesh is believed to be the epi epicenter of sort of cholera um, and where it's been around for a long time and still very common. And we did a scan, again, found 305 regions under selection, tested our top candidates and found associations with cholera. So we think that this is a way that we can not only find out about human past, but also get to things that are very meaningful for human health. And with that, I'll just tell you a little bit about the work we do in microbial evolution. Uh, my lab is actually really turning its focus, as Provost Garber said, into really studying these infectious diseases because we're fascinated by them. Um, and one of the reasons I became very fascinated with uh, the disease he described, Lassa fever, is because when we did our first scan of natural selection, the top candidate that we identified um, in a Nigerian population, the Yoruba, was a gene called large on chromosome 22. It was a very striking signal of selection in that, on that chromosome. And as I started to explore what the gene does, actually, um, again, talking about the very amazing uh, collaborative environment here in Boston, Monty Krieger had pointed to me. He said, you know, that, that's a very important gene in muscular dystrophy, a very important gene in general. You should explore it. And as I began to explore it, I realized that not only is it important in muscle development, but it's actually an important uh, has an important biological function. This gene large, which is the yellow one here, is what we call a, a, a gly glycosyl transferase. It post-translationally, once the protein is made, modifies alpha dystroglycan. So here's all the lingo. <laughs> so alpha dystroglycan is a gene that's important, as we know, for, for sort of muscle development, but also expressed on many cell surfaces. And once alpha dystroglycan is created, large will actually add these glycosyl groups, these elements to the outside of the protein. It causes it to be cleaved, moved to the cell surface, and there at the cell surface, it has a number of different functions, but one thing that happens is it's often co-opted by microbes. Um, arena viruses are commonly co-opting it. And so Mike Oldstone at Scripps showed that if you knock out alpha dystoglycan and this process doesn't happen, arena viruses, in particular Lassa virus, cannot enter the cell. And so at that time, I didn't know really what Lassa virus was, actually. To be honest, in my, I went back to my medical textbook, and it's like a footnote in a table, um, just you know, one of the arena viruses, not really described. Um, and so I started to explore what Lassa virus is, and I became more and more interested in it. And so this gene critical for infection of Lassa virus uh, sort of pointed me to this. And as it turns out, Lassa virus is a hemorrhagic fever, like Ebola or Marburg. Um, it's, these numbers are actually very back of the envelope because there's very little work that's been done on it, but it's estimated to kill uh, over 20,000 people a year and also infect hundreds of thousands, if not millions. So the interesting thing is that it's, it's actually quite widespread if you believe the seroprevalence surveys, and there's some issues with the sensitivity and specificity of those, but they, but they do seem to indicate that in parts of West Africa, this virus is very, very common. So, in fact, 21% of Nigerians um, seem to be, uh, have been exposed to this virus. And I should mention one of those exciting moments in science is when I was looking at large, looking at Lassa virus, the signal selection I'd found in Nigeria, and I discovered that Lassa is actually named after a village in Nigeria called Lassa, Nigeria, where it was first dis discovered. Um, and so I started looking at it and realizing this is actually very common, 21% in Nigerian populations. Some of the Sierra Leonean populations I've been sur surveyed have over 50% of the population having evidence of being exposed to this virus. And it makes sense that there's so much evidence of exposure because this rodent, Mastomys natalensis, has learned to basically breed um, Lassa, co-evolved to breed Lassa in its blood. Some of the populations that my collaborators have looked at, over 50% of the rodents are actually carrying it in their blood at any point in time. It's extreme exposure. But the interesting thing is, this is what we call a biosafety level four agent, or category A, meaning that fatality rates are extreme, and in, in many outbreak settings, uh, over 50%. In Sierra Leone, our fatality rate with treatment is 70% right now, which is, uh, which is devastating. Um, so you're seeing these extreme fatality rates of individuals coming in with loss of fever. It, you know, it is known to be aerosolized. Um, it has very quick uh, infection rates. So it's so interesting that suddenly you have this thing that is a category A agent, a biosafety level four agent, that's an immediate public health crisis affecting many people. But we now believe that the fact that there are so many people that have been exposed but have no history of it is that it might be a selective force driving this. 
And so we set out to do this work. We moved into the field in Nigeria and in Sierra Leone, and we are now doing large-scale stu studies that I won't, I'll just tell you are, are ongoing, to study the virus itself, to understand how long it's been around, how it's been evolving and changing, and then to study genetic resistance. Um, and we've set up a diagnostic lab there, um, and already not only have we been able to carry out this work in a meaningful way and begin to do the research, but it also has had an impact already on the um, already on the individuals in those populations. Fatality rates are extreme. Um, fatality rates for pregnant women are 100% uh, essentially. For the fetus is 100%, for the mother it's sort of in that range. But we're now seeing many of the pregnant women survive as we begin to diagnose individuals early um, and as we are able to give them uh, treatment that, that can be supportive. Um, I apologize, I normally give a moment for this slide, sorry. Uh, so the next slide, uh, if you, um, uh, if you want to turn away, I'll just flash it for a couple seconds and let you know. It, which is that um, I want to just show you an image of what some of our, the classic patients that we see uh, look like. Again, it's a hemorrhagic fever. So again, here's the slide. Um, which is essentially, as you might expect, as one thinks about when they think of Ebola as overt bleeding from many different, um, different uh, body parts or uh, mucosal beds. But the more we began to study this virus, the more we began to work the, and diagnose individuals, so having a, a PCR-based test that we could diagnose individuals, the more we saw that most of our patients come in looking like this, that, don't, that look sort of seemingly innocuous. These fatality rates are similar. The, they're extraordinary fatality rates, 70% right now in Sierra Leone, 30% in Nigeria. Um, but at the same time, they're going undetected. Most of these individuals are going undetected because we're not, we're expecting to see sort of the Hollywood version, the, the promoted version of, of what this would look like. But this is the interesting thing. These diseases are amongst us, but working in this way. And so it led us to begin to explore this other area that's become a fascination of my group called emerging disease or emerging diagnosis. Is we believe that all of these diseases like Lassa virus and Ebola virus emerged in the last part of the 20th century because of globalization. But as we're beginning to study it, we're more sort of invested in understanding whether or not it's actually just an emergence of the ability to diagnose these things. And so we're really working right now at the Broad Institute to develop new technologies. We've just gotten two, our, our collaborator in Nigeria, Christian Happy, has just gotten two major grants from the World Bank and NIH to build facilities in Nigeria, the first, the first actual next generation sequencing machine in Nigeria itself. And what we want to do is help the communities actually, you know, uh, we started with the high throughput genomics, but really refining diagnostics, bringing the diagnostics right there as we can begin to explore. Because one of the things that we see is that when we partner with these communities, they become invested, the, the doctors become empowered, and we're beginning to see more and more of these things um, as we come closer. And the last thing I just want to mention is just a couple of things that the, my lab generally does, is all of the work that we're doing in human genome, we've also been doing in collaboration with Diane Wirth and Sarah Volkman at the School of Public Health on the malaria genome, investigating how it's been evolving and changing over time. And my lab, fundamentally, is a computational lab. And so we develop a suite of tools that allow not just our group, but other groups to also invest both in looking at data um, sort of in rapid time, uh, sort of work supporting epidemiologists to, rep to rapidly look at patterns that are emerging in their data sets, to investigate natural selection, and now that we work in the field to do um, sort of field analysis without sort of developing field deployable limb systems. Um, and then with that, I just want to thank my lab, uh, the different uh, individuals who have done this work. There's too many individuals to thank uh, because all of this work, as you can imagine, is not just multidisciplinary but highly collaborative. But I always just sort of now when I'm, I have the too many people to thank, I just show them the different holiday cards. The, uh, since 2008, all of this work that's being described are occurring by individuals in my group. Uh, the group keeps growing. They involve a lot of our collaborators from Africa. Um, well, they, yeah, the, the cards have sort of uh, taken off over time um, and uh, taken on, so bringing in the kind of historical uh, point, um, the Academy of Athens, and then coming down to pop culture uh, with the Gangnam style. Um, the, uh, so the, you know, my, my group, I said they're extraordinary and I'm very lucky to work with them. I'm also very lucky to work with collaborators um, in uh, Nigeria. Um, and also in Sierra Leone, uh, amazing individuals working at the sort of the front lines of, of dangerous areas. The Broad community, um, the Lassa consortium that we work with, the Harvard community that we work with, the teams from all over uh, aspects of 
the Boston community and the international community they work with. Thank you very much. So um, that was a, a wonderful talk. Um, I've known uh, Pardis' work for uh, uh, more than a decade and uh, admired it. And uh, what I especially admire about, about Pardis is that um, there's a, this famous quote of Marx that uh, philosophers have only interpreted the world. The point is to change it. Uh, most of us scientists in this room are simply advancing knowledge but not really doing anything with it. But you heard, particularly about the work in Nigeria, the genetics work is directly uh, affecting um, the, the, the health uh, uh, in the, of a very, very serious uh, uh, medical problem. And I think that's just wonderful. So I thought I'd use my uh, privilege up here to just ask two questions and then briefly open it to the floor because we're running a little late. So my first question is I'd like to ask parties about failures. So you have, um, uh, you have um, uh, uh, many signals of selection, some of which um, I'm sure are so strong they must be right, mm -hmm. right? What about places where you have absolutely no idea what the functional, what the functional significance is? Um, are there such things? Oh yeah, that's, that's mm -hmm. the majority of them, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's an interesting, so uh, thank you, Nick. Um, and so, yeah, as, as Nick said, we've been working together for a decade, and I've been admiring his work and love the way it connects together. Um, so failures, and, and in both of our work, we probably say failures are common. Lots of areas, you're always in areas where you don't know uh, sort of ter new terrain. The really interesting thing about the work we do, I, I like to say, is it's, it's fun because it's hypothesis generation, right? We, we are creating all these new hypotheses. We're going in directions we never would have expected all the time, like loss of fever. Um, most of the regions we identify, we're now just finally at the point where we can even figure out where the signals are coming from. And then the problem that we have is within those regions, we're not even sure, you know, if it's, if what the gene might be doing, often we're getting these sort of hypothetical genes. And so we're trying to always explore that space. Um, the big thing that we're trying to do is we've got very actually like, a lot of times with Diana, the postdoc working on the project, we sort of stop and say like, boy, I'm, you know, thank goodness that worked, right? Because that was many years of her work to try to build that mouse model. But we, you know, how did we know that it actually would be real and, and that, it, that it would show a phenotype? So it's an extraordinary, treacherous area that we go in when we go into the functional characterization. And we only do it when we have very good evidence. We had a lot of things pointing us to the fact that that'd be biologically meaningful. Um, right now in my group, we have a huge effort to basically make the... Um, functional characters, so, so making the functional characterization more high throughput as well. So we're very good at now annotating or doing the selection scan and annotating in real time. We have now high throughput scans to test function for a lot of different mutations. So that's a big area we're going to to help us. But yeah. and, um, my second question is, uh, uh, Pardis talked about uh, cholera in Bangladesh, and there was a strong signal selection there, and Lassa fever in West Africa, and, uh, strong signal selection, uh, but the uh, the most famous disease over the last 2,000 years in Eurasia is virtually without question bubonic plague with massive death rates. And um, I'd like to ask um, if there's evidence that shaped uh, the, the genome of uh, most of the people sitting in this room. Okay. Um, sure. So... Uh, the bubonic plague is obviously something that's been of great interest to lots of people, and it had such a huge impact, you know, taking a third to two-thirds of the population of Europe and throughout the world out. Um, it makes us believe that there was selection. I actually, one of the hardest papers I ever had to write as a graduate student with Eric Lander was a paper debunking, actually with the original uh, researchers, sort of debunking the, the possibility that CCR5, a mutation that's important in HIV, um, rose to selection, uh, rose, sorry, rose to high prevalence through selection, likely due to the bubonic plague. We actually, I said, I set out with the original authors to try to characterize that signal more, and as we, the more we pursued it, the more we realized there was no signal there. So um, it was an important paper to write, but obviously not the kind you want to write. Um, the, um, so, so that signal, that sort of that, that hypothesis that this mutation that protects from the plague, um, sorry, that protects from HIV might have been under selection from the plague, 
is probably, you know, sort of the evidence is not very good for that. But one of the interesting things that we found in our, one of our scans was that the two, sort of two proteins that together make a complex that Yersinia pestis binds to are both under selection in Asians. And that was sort of fascinating for us. We're not sure if the signal, we don't want to sort of play into the same thing. We were excited about it. Um, because actually while the bubonic plague is very famous in Europe for the mass devastation, it's actually believed to have emerged in Asia. And so it's believed sort of the, the oldest sort of track traces are within Asian populations. So we began to hypothesize whether or not Asians had been exposed to it a very long time, developed resistance, but then it emerged and went to Europe to a naive population. So again, that's actually just a very vague hypothesis. We're really interested in the fact that those genes are emerging. Um, and there may be other ones in there. But again, we don't know how it all works. So that's what we're trying to piece together with time. So we are running late. And I think we should just take a, a, a couple of questions. I'm not sure. How, how, are we gonna, how, how are we working the microphone here? Okay. Just, oh, great. Yes. <laughs> Oh, fascinating talk. I have two questions about Lassa fever. Okay. One, the easy one, I think, is how do you determine on a large scale that 21% have been exposed to Lassa? And the other question is the dramatic, almost threefold higher death rate in Sierra Leone than Nigeria. How do you trace that back to see what's behind it, so to say? Sure. Um, yep. So uh, the the seroprevalence surveys that I described with the 21% in Nigeria, I, I should have made more clear. It's very difficult to do. It has been historically very difficult to do those surveys because we you needed a biosafety level four lab in order to even do the surveys. So these are just small samplings of the populations, but the populations tested in Nigeria in those biosafety level four settings showed 21% exposure based on antibodies to the virus. Um, and then the pockets that they done in Sierra Leone was a, a range, but the, at the highest was over 50% of populations, but in some populations, 9% or something like that. So it's, it's all very patchy right now. Uh, my collaborator, Bob Gary at Tulane, has developed a recombinant assay that you can do much more readily, and we're, we're doing a, a remap of everything. So, so yeah, that's just what is known right now, but it'll become much more clear as more people begin to look at it. The fatality rates actually, it's a longer answer, so I'll just give you a short answer, but that's the really exciting part about working in the virus and working on the human, uh, sorry, the human side simultaneously, is we're getting information from both sides that are really fascinating. On the viral side, we've sequenced over 100 viruses from the different countries, as well as from rodents and humans. And we, it seems as if the virus has actually been circulating for over 1,000 years in Nigeria, maybe much longer, but our like minimum estimate is 1, 000, over 1,000 years. And it only actually emerged in Sierra Leone about 150 years ago. And also, those, those signals of selection and association that we find in Nigeria, we don't see in Sierra Leone. So what we believe is actually the virus has been circulating in, in Nigeria and, develop, and individuals have been developing resistance that they don't have in Sierra Leone. The other thing that's fascinating is that the virus, as it moved out of Nigeria into Sierra Leone, has evolved dramatically. It's changed its codon usage to look more like uh, humans and rodents, so that means it can replicate faster. And it also has changed a number of other codons that seem to be important in its function. So two things may be happening. One is the Nigerians may have resistance that the rest of us don't have because it's older there. And two, the virus is actually quite different in Sierra Leone and has seemingly evolved to be more virulent. So we're exploring both of those things, but that's sort of our off the presses uh, preliminary data. Uh, our leader, Mike, would like to keep this short, so I think we'll take just one more question, and then perhaps you can grab Pardis during the breaks. Any more questions? Yes, Johannes. Um, so, Johannes Krause, um, you showed this, this EDAR gene that you have actually found to be under selection in, in East Asians. What's the hypothesis? Why was it selected, the sweat glands and the, the hair? So what would be kind of the driving forces, selective force on this? Yeah, um, uh, boy, we're not sure. So we, um, the, if you read the paper, uh, um, 
we spent a lot of time trying to figure out that discussion of what to describe. So what's interesting about the EDAR mutation is that it's pleiotropic. It affects so many different things. It affects the sweat glands, the hair thickness, the mammary glands. It also actually, in work we didn't do in the mouse but has been done in humans, changes the formation of teeth, uh, causes shoveling that Asians find uh, in their teeth. So, And there are many things we might not even know what it does. So we're not actually even at that point where we could you know, say definitively or even close to that what it is. We just do know that it affects these types of things. One of the, in our discussion, one of the ones we thought might be very viable, Dan Lieberman has done a lot of work with long distance running and thermoregulation, uh, was very excited about the possibility that uh, humans are the only organisms with eccrine glands that are using their sort of sweating in order to thermoregulate. So that thermoregulation is important. And it's a very humid climate in central China, particularly at the time when these mutations were emerging. So it could be driven by that, but honestly, it could be so many things. That's what's both complicating and exciting about the finding is that there's a, there's a lot to explore. Thank you.